for the reading of our gospel this morning. Our gospel can be found on page 844 in our Pew Bibles. Luke chapter 10, beginning with verse 25. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this, and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him. And when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, The one who showed mercy. Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Grace and peace to you from the one who created us, the one who draws near to us, and the one who brings us into everlasting life with him, Jesus Christ. Two years ago, I was serving a church in Davenport, Iowa. It was a Saturday night worship, pretty normal. I was leading the worship that night, and my friend Pastor Katie was preaching. Now, everything about the evening was rather normal until midway through the service. Midway through our worship, as Katie was almost done with the sermon, a gentleman walked into the worship space. He walked all the way to the front of the sanctuary, and he sat down in the front row where no one else was sitting. I had never seen this man before. He was middle-aged, wearing a military vest with patches. His appearance was disheveled, He was carrying a rather large backpack, and he was visibly upset. His behavior from the moment he sat down was erratic. He would stand up, and he would pace. He'd walk over to the baptism font. He would dip his hands in the water, walk back to his seat, just to start the process again, all the while weeping loudly. His presence certainly did not go unnoticed by the rest of the congregation. As I watched everyone, I saw their reaction as they sat up straighter in their pews, as they tensed up. Well, I have to admit that my first reaction to this man was not compassion. My first response was fear. My heart started to beat rapidly, and I had that feeling on the back of my neck when you can feel your hairs start to stand up. 
I felt extremely vulnerable. I was unsure of this man's emotional or mental state. I was unsure of what he had in that backpack. I was unsure if he was dangerous or just profoundly upset or all of the above. Pastor Katie, she glanced at me quickly, and I knew that she was feeling the same way, but she calmly concluded the sermon. And in the back of the sanctuary, I noticed the building host whispering into the ears of members sitting in the back row. Slowly and calmly, during the hymn, these members walked to the front pew and sat down on either side of the man. I saw one of the members carefully and respectfully move the man's backpack underneath the pew so that he could move closer to him. And I saw the other member place her hand on the man's shoulder, smile at him, and whisper into his ear. The man never stopped crying, but his tense posture softened. During the prayers of the people, the woman took this man's hand and prayed with him. And following the prayer, we passed the peace. And when I say we, I mean everyone. People came down from the back to offer this man peace. Some even joined the two members in the front row and stayed with them, later walking forward with this man to receive communion. After worship, these kind members gathered with the man in the lobby. They sat with him and they talked with him. And later I was told they took him to dinner. Now we can't ever know the extent of this man's pain or the full spectrum of challenges in his life. And I do know that there are many places where he would have been asked to leave because of his disruptive behavior. Who knows why he chose that particular Lutheran church to walk in on that particular night. And who knows what impact that night had on the man. But I do know that that experience had an impact on me. I was inspired by the actions of the members that night. I was inspired by the ways in which they drew near to him. Their actions remind me of the Samaritan in Jesus' parable. The Samaritan who extended compassion to a stranger whose need moved him to help. While all the while we heard others preferred to walk by, either too busy or too afraid to draw near to him. This beloved parable is called the Good Samaritan. And yet, the Samaritan is never actually called good in the story. So what actually makes the Samaritan good? I imagine that we could have a rousing debate about this, but I would like to offer one suggestion. What if the Samaritan was good because he simply made the choice to come near the almost dead guy in the ditch, to approach him, to decrease the distance between him and the man clearly in need of help. Caroline Lewis is a professor at Luther Seminary, and she says, what if eternal life might be known here and now in this place, in nearness, not remoteness, in proximity, not reserve, in deciding to be closer and not looking for ways to push away. She goes on to offer a critique of culture. She says, we expend a lot of energy in our lives toward decided detachment, disengagement, and disenfranchisement. At the same time as I was reading her papers, there was a story on the radio that spoke to just what she was talking about. This particular example speaks to the way that we as a culture and a world are becoming 
increasingly detached and disengaged. Apparently, there's a well-known songwriter, a singer-songwriter who has been making a lot of headlines, and she made a, a lot of headlines for calling out a fan of hers who is in the crowd of one of her performances. This man had a video camera and was watching her perform live through his video camera lens. And the artist challenged the fan. Well, can you stop filming me with a video camera? Because I'm really here in real life. You can enjoy the show in real life, not through the lens of your camera. This example, like I said, speaks to the way we as a culture are becoming increasingly detached from one another, detached from people as real people with real feelings, real hopes, real dreams, cares, and hurts. And while there are so many scary things going on in the world, I wonder if the most terrifying is how we are increasingly living our lives detached now, I have to recognize that we do have to exercise some wisdom. Safety, self-preservation, self-care, these are important. They're real, we, we talk to our kids about things like this with words like stranger danger. But sometimes, like Dr. Lewis, I am convinced that creating and maintaining our distance and our detachment from one another, especially those that are different from us, is maybe a fear to change. We have our minds and our hearts set to a certain way of thinking and believing about the world and faith and God and humanity, and we're not going to let anyone budge us. This lawyer, he knew the law. He wasn't too ready to budge. And Jesus asks him, who is the neighbor in the story? Jesus asks us, who are our neighbors? Well, quite frankly, we are all neighbors. No one is excluded. Your neighbor is not just the person living next door to you. Your neighbor is not one who happens to be convenient for you to help. Your neighbors are not just those who meet the qualifications of your company. Your neighbor is someone who, without a doubt, is experiencing pain, struggles, challenges, and sorrow, and yet you draw near to them. Your neighbor is someone who clearly has needs, and you decide, I will help you. Your neighbor is someone who might even resist your assistance, but you insist on it anyway. In the Gospel today, Jesus shows us what it looks like. He points to the Samaritan and he tells us to do likewise. After all, drawing near to one another is what God's love looks like. God's decision to become human is just such an act. A commitment to closeness, a desire to close the distance, a need for nearness with us. Go and do likewise, Jesus says. So we do it. When we say that Trinity is sharing God's love, we recognize that our baptisms have brought us into a community of mercy, compassion, and love. So we promise to move into intimate and loving relationships with a hurting humanity and a hurting world. More than this, we recognize that loving our neighbor can be messy and sometimes inconvenient. But we lean into the courage that God gives us, and we do it. There is no greater intimate love and compassion given than what our Good Samaritan Jesus gives us by crossing the border between human and divine in order to bind up and tend our wounds to nourish and care for us when we are lying in life's ditches. 
Our good Samaritan Jesus does this today in word, in meal, and in community so that we can go forth as agents of God's love and mercy to draw near to and to see and to engage and help real people in a real world in need. Who is my neighbor? The lawyer asked Jesus. And like any good teacher, he responds with a question. Who acted as a neighbor? Jesus asks. The one who extended compassion, the lawyer replied. Jesus' parable of being a good Samaritan, a good neighbor, means a commitment to coming near when we see a human being who is experiencing pain and challenge. And maybe, just maybe, someone this week or this month or this year will approach you and they will say, why did you do that for that person? And maybe you can respond, because when I was struggling, hurt, alone, or in pain, it was life-saving to have someone who saw me and reached out and touched me with their care and compassion. Thanks be to God. Amen.